So, why do we read and reread the Bible? Well, the first thing that I, I sort of thought of is um, just the very fact that, I don't know about you, but I need to read and reread things in order to really comprehend it. Unless I'm really super interested in something, I have to do that. Doesn't anybody identify with that? You can't just read something once and get and grasp everything that's being written. So you have to reread things in order to really get it. But to her point, you know, I don't really reread my fa- even my, some of my favorite stories or my favorite nonfiction books. I don't really reread those all the time the way we reread the Bible. So part of it is indeed having the opportunity to grasp it. But the other part of it that we're going to look at today is why, like what it is that we're grasping and why it's so important. So again, unless you're, unless I'm very interested in something, I find it hard to, to comprehend things that I read. So I have to reread things, but I'm also a bit of a audio visual learner. There's different kinds of learners, uh, different kinds of ways that people learn visual, audio, you know, sometimes you have to do things and actually, you know, live things out in order to grasp what you're learning. So I find it interesting, and, and, and this is something that I discovered years ago, is that the Jewish people have a lot of traditions, a lot of customs that help them to take the scripture and not, not just read it, like that can be a boring thing if you just read something. Why not take what you read and sort of try to live it out as best you can and have reminders and have different things that will, you know, get you your, your, your brain going. So Moses actually said in Deuteronomy that you should take God's commandments and tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. And he also said to write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So these customs go all the way back to Deuteronomy. And so this is what the Jewish people do. They take these little pieces of written out scriptures and they place it in a little box and they put it on their doorposts. And they also take scripture that's written down, they put it in leather boxes and they strap these boxes to their forehead and to their arms. And they literally, therefore, have the Bible on their doorposts of their homes and every time they walk through that doorpost, they touch it. And it reminds them that this is a home that believes in scripture, that lives by scripture, and every morning, Jewish men pray with these boxes on their head and on their arms, and it reminds them that no matter what I think, and no matter what I do with my hands, I'm going to do it through the wisdom of Scripture and, and, and you know, with God's commandments on my mind and in my actions. And so these, and these customs go all the way back, like I said, to Moses, and in the days of Jesus, uh, these would have been the norm, right? And if you go into a Jewish community today, you'll still see these boxes. The, the box is called a mezuzah, right? And the, and the boxes uh, that you put on your forehead and arm, they're called tefillin. And these, you know, I, unless you're in somebody's home or in a synagogue, you probably won't see people wearing tefillin. But it's funny, when my parents and I and other people were on our way to Israel and we were in the plane, you know, uh, we, we left at nighttime here in Canada and then eventually, at some point during the, the nine-hour flight or however long it was, a lot of these Jewish men stood up and they put on their prayer shawl and then they started strapping these boxes to their forehead. And, and we were, so I knew what was happening, but my parents were like, what's going on here? And other people from our church didn't really know what was going on. And, and that's what they were doing. They were trying to take scripture and bring it alive, bring it up, make it a part of your life. There's one more custom and tradition that I think the Jewish people do that is fascinating. And I was almost thinking of maybe trying to recreate it here. Maybe we'll do this one day. But they, they don't just have the Bible in book form. That would be easy, right? Because you can get the, that anywhere. But they rely on this old tradition of actually writing out the whole first five books of the Bible, called the Torah, on a scroll. And an actual scribe does it all in Hebrew perfectly. And, and, and if you were to roll out the scroll, it would be, I don't know how long it would be, but it would be very long because it would be all five books of Moses on this big scroll. And then there it is right there. They put this scroll of the, of the first five books of, of Moses, the, the Torah, in this case. And you notice there's a crown on it, right? There's even like a metal crown on top. They're trying to 
tr- trying to uh, get us to see and feel that God, who is king, is in those books. Right? The commandments of God, the commandments of the king himself, are there. And you know what they do? They don't just bring it up to the front. They cart it around the whole congregation. And they sing while they do it. And all of you who are out in the seats would, would touch, touch the, 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 the Torah scroll with your hands or with a book. And you would, and you would like, revere it. Right? And it's, it's quite this experience of, of, of the rabbi and whoever taking the Torah scroll and, and bringing it around the congregation. And everybody wants to touch it and everybody wants to revere it. Why? Because, again, God and, and, and his commandments are in the text. Right? And that's how we should treat. And then they bring the, the Torah scroll up, they lift it up, and they place it down, and then they call up people to read it. And they've been doing this. And then this is what happens. They do that every single Saturday morning, week after week, week after week, so that in one year, they've read the whole five books of Moses, the Torah. And they do that every year. They just start from the beginning again. They go from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, and then once that's done, they start again at Genesis. So talk about rereading. Jewish people who attend synagogue listen and read and have the, the text read every single year. Right? So that's amazing. But that still doesn't ask, answer the question of why would we do that? That just gets us thinking about that there must be something special about this book. Something special about the scripture. Well, Paul gave us the answer in his letter to Timothy. He said, all scripture is inspired by God. That's why it's special, because it's inspired by God. But what what do we mean when we say something like if you're inspired? Well, usually that means that you have some motivation or some sense of, um, you know, I was writing a song or I was writing a poem and I felt inspired to write it in such a way. It's like a feeling you get. Well, that's not quite what Paul's talking about here, although there's probably some of that in there. But he literally is saying, all scripture is breathed out by God. The word that they translate here in the NLT as inspired is a word that Paul probably made up. He was not a native Greek speaker, so sometimes he would actually just put two words together and say, yeah, there you go, there's a word. (laughs) And so this word is God-breathed. And it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. So again, Paul probably made it up. But the point is this, and here's what I think. I could be wrong about this, but this is what I think. That God breathes out and then into the writings of the scripture. So imagine God, you know, speaking, and then that going into the person who's writing the scripture, and then out comes what they wrote. And so you get this amazing amalgamation of what the person believes and understood and writes, but with God's breath, God's influence on that. I'll give you another example. Adam was, a, you know, the, the, the first human being, as it's told up to us in the book of Genesis and scripture, Adam was just a guy, right? He was just a human. There was nothing supernatural about Adam as a person, as a, as a creature, He was a human being, like all of us, right? But what did God do? He breathed the breath of life into him, right? God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, and he became a living person. So, uh, there's a certain degree of metaphor going on here. There's a certain degree of, this is, uh, 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 you know, imagery. But nevertheless, let's talk about what this is saying that God brought Adam alive by breathing into his nostrils, by breathing into him. Well, that's what I see is happening with scripture. Look, the Bible is filled with just what people wrote. You know, like we can go, go through the history of how the Bible was written and we can see these are just regular people, right? Moses was a regular guy. David was a regular guy. Paul was a regular guy. Right? The only one was Jesus, who was not so regular, um, but he didn't write anything in the Bible. <laughs> right? But we, things, a lot of things were written about him, but he didn't write anything in the Bible. So my point is this, is that the Bible, the books themselves, the writings are human-based. They were written by human beings. 
but God breathed into them in such a way where I think embedded within the scripture is something special. And we're going to look at that in a second. But I really, really like how the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase, it's not literally what it says, but it's, it gives us the sense of what it says. It says that every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another. See that? Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. So that through scripture we are put together and shaped, shaped up for the tasks that God has for us. The, the main point I want us to understand is every part of scripture is God breathed, breathed into by God, and therefore becomes useful in some way. Now, how and, and, and what exactly is useful about each part of the Bible? We're mostly going to get to that next week, okay? But the point is this, is that every part of scripture has been breathed out and into by God and therefore has something special about it for us to learn and for us to take into us, into our lives. So the Bible, again, is useful in one way or another because it is given life by God to help us see the truth about, for example, what is right and wrong, right? Or how we can grow in our character as people. Those are some of the most important things that we can learn in the scripture. But there's another sort of way I want us to think about this, and this might be a little abstract. I tried to sort of preview this with my dad yesterday, and uh, I, I struggled with it because it's kind of abstract and hard to explain. But we read the, why do we read the Bible? We read it, again, because it's inspired by God. It's breathed out by God, but we can put it a different way. The Bible contains the Logos. right? Have we heard this term before, the Logos? What's the English translation? Word, right? And we get this from that Greek word logos. Literally just means word or a person's speech, person's word, what they're saying, right? But I think if we try to think a little more abstractly, I think we'll get something interesting out of this. I want us to think about exactly what's happening right now. So I'm taking my mind and my body the, the different systems of my mind and body to produce speech, right? But have you ever thought about this? I'm literally taking, not consciously, but just because this is how it works, I'm taking thousands of years of language evolution, you know, to get us to this point where we have the English language that I can speak and you can understand. Just using it, thousands of years of evolution to get us there, right? What about thousands of years of knowledge accumulating? And I don't have all of that knowledge or all of that evolution of language in me, but to whatever degree I do have, I'm using it right now. So I'm taking all of that knowledge, all of that accumulation of, of human progress and using it to say something. And there, then you guys take your ears and your mind and your body systems to receive that and to understand what I'm saying. Like we're standing upon a, like a lot that has come before us to get us to this point where we can do this, right? But then we add the whole technological element and we have even more to be in awe of because I'm not only speaking to you and you guys are receiving it here in the room, but I'm speaking into this microphone and the microphone's going to the sound system, the sound system's going to the computer and that's going out to the internet and people at home are watching on their laptops or on their phones or on their TVs or whatever, and they're receiving it and they're hearing it just like you guys are, right? Like, we should be humbled every single day just by talking, thinking about the nature of talking to each other and communicating in this way. But I, I bring all this up because this is the word. This is what's being referenced when the Bible talks about the word, the logos, Again, it's kind of abstract, and I don't know if we're all going to get what I'm, if I'm going to properly explain what, I'm, <laughs> what I have in my mind, but let's look at what it says in John chapter 1, verse 1. We know this verse, right? But let's put the word logos in there instead. In the beginning was the logos, because that's what it, is, it says in the Greek. In the beginning was the logos, 
and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Right? There's lots of ways that Christians understand this verse, but I, I tend to think that John is almost certainly calling back to the Genesis story, right? The story of creation. He uses the word in the beginning, right? The phrase in the beginning, which is the first phrase in the Bible. So I think he's wanting us to think back to that story, right? What did God do to bring order to the chaos? Do you remember what it says? The earth was formless and void. So it's not creation out of nothing. It's creation from chaos to order. That's what it seems like in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, that the world was in a mess. There was water everywhere, right? And what did God do to bring order to that chaos, to separate the waters and to make the dry land appear and all that stuff? What did he do? He spoke, right? So there's something powerful in speech because, again, it's taking all of that knowledge, all of that that background information, so to speak, and bleh, putting it out there. Now, when we speak, we have a real good possibility of having a good effect or a bad effect, depending on what we say, depending on how people receive it, right? God speaks and brings order to chaos. So we want to know what God has to say, right? Because we want that same order from the chaos, don't we? We know life can get chaotic, right? Hey, uh, this is so obvious, I don't even need to ask you to put up your hands. But have you ever felt like your life was chaotic or, or you know, too much for you? Like you, you, there was just so many things going on, or even if there was just a couple things going on, but the weight of that was too much for you to bear. Have you ever felt that way? Well, God speaks and brings order to that chaos, and the way, what well, is like, okay, so what does that, how does that affect us? I haven't heard God speak. Anybody hear God speak? Some people say they have. But I find that we have God's word in the Bible. And I, I say it that way because that's very much the way I think of it. It's not that the entire Bible is the word of God. It is that the word of God is in the Bible. And it's up to us to work with God to try to decipher that that word that's in the Bible, the Logos. And now look at what it says. No, go back, sorry, Lynn. That in the beginning was the word. And so he's saying that the Logos was there with God, so to speak. And that's a very poetic way of saying that it was, it, was, it was owned by God. It was part of God. In fact, the Logos was God. And the pro I think the proper way to understand that last line is the Logos was divine. It was something representative of God. It's actually not too different insofar as I'm imperfect and he's perfect, but it's kind of similar to how I can speak and my speech is representing me, right? I've often given this example. If I were to speak loud enough, I could speak loud enough that Timothy and Jonathan could hear me, right? In that other room. Um, now, would I be in that other room? No, right? But my voice would be, and they would hear my voice, and they could respond to my voice. They would have to interpret what I'm saying, right? Does that make sense? Like, that's what the scripture is. I should have brought a Bible up and so I could hold it up and say, that's what the Bible is, right? It's, it's in here, too. You can find it on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, there's one. Here, show it to the camera. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The voice of our Father is in there. Again, that doesn't mean everything in the Bible, we, we can't say everything in the Bible is of God because there's some strange stuff in the Bible. We're going to get into that next week. There's some strange stuff in the Bible, right? There's, there's some stuff that we should all cringe over, quite frankly. And that represents the human side of the Bible. But the God side of the Bible is something that is powerful and will transform us. And that's why we read the Bible over and over again to try to get that God stuff out of it. Now, here's the interesting thing. And this, again, a bit of a lead in, into next week. Because the Logos, the Word of God, is in the Bible. And it's a, an expression of God, and it's in the Bible. But it's also in a person. And that's 
why it's so interesting that John, the Apostle John, did not start with the birth narratives, Matthew and Luke. They both have the Christmas story, so to speak, the, the birth narrative. Mark just skips all that and goes right to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But what does the Apostle John do? He starts with this prologue. He says, in the beginning was the word, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. It was representative of God. And then he shocks everyone, saying, the word became flesh, in verse 14. The word became flesh and lived among us. So that same expression of God that brought order to the chaos, and that we find in scripture, is now embodied in the person of Jesus. So that we can now look at Jesus and say, there's the Logos of God. There it is. The expression of God is in Jesus. So that Jesus could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Why? Because in him is the voice of the Father himself. The expression and the thoughts and the plans and the purposes of God are all in one person, and that's Jesus. This is why we, why we revere him, why we are devoted to him, why we bother with him, because Jesus brings us to God. If not, Jesus would just be another good teacher, uh, just another good historical figure that we might find interesting. But he's special because in him is the very logos of God. So if we follow Jesus, he will show us the way. If we listen to him, he will speak the truth. And if we embrace him, he will give us life. And this is why the Apostle John said that he wrote this, the whole purpose of writing his gospel was to get us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that we may have life in his name. So the very same logos that brought order to the formless and void earth is the same logos that we can have in us as we embrace Jesus and he imparts that life into us, that truth into us. So to the, to the degree that we embrace that way, life, and truth and that's in Jesus, to, to the degree that we embrace it, we can have that same result in our lives. Order from the chaos, bringing order to the chaos, and, and allowing us to live an abundant life. It's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Eternal life, that may have been last week, eternal life begins now, right? To the degree that we embrace Jesus and the life that he has in him. So we read and reread the Bible because it enables us to discover this logos, this amazing expression of God. Let's watch this second part of the video. Over the years, I have begun to see more and more that the Bible is in fact abundant in a weird and unique way. I have come into that richer understanding of the Bible not by thinking abstractly about why we read scripture, but by actually living with the Bible, reading it, praying it, and praying that I might become a person who can hear its liveliness. Once a week, I take a Bible to some location that is not my house or my office or my church. I go to a riverside or shopping mall or prison or flagpole, and I read a short passage of scripture there and sit with the passage for a while, maybe 10 minutes, maybe three hours. It's amazing what you sometimes hear, like Jesus' words about wealth sound very different when I read them in the lobby of my bank. Romans 13, where Paul is talking about how followers of Jesus should relate to the state, sounds very different in prison or underneath that flagpole. This, by the way, is something else I don't do, even with my favorite reread them once a year novels and novellas. I don't take them to strange places in hopes that I might hear better what they have to say, because actually I don't think those novels have all that much to say. They have three or four or five things to say, and I can hear most of those things just fine by reading them on my front porch. Just uh, responding to somebody in the chat there. But, so I hope we can now maybe a little bit further understand why we would read and reread the Bible and how it's ne the, <laughs> we're never done reading the Bible because, first of all, it's a lot to read. But even if you are a very good reader and you're able to read through the Bible very quickly, you want to reread it and you want to dig into it and get 
what's embedded within it, which is the logos itself. This logos, this word of God, this expression of God that we have in the Bible is what enables us to find truth. And not just truth about what we should believe about God and and believe about uh, different parts of scripture. That's important. But I mean truth about literally everything and anything. Right? How how do you think... let Let me just see if I can use this as an example. If a man and a woman... A husband and a wife are fighting about something. How, how do you think they can resolve that, that fight and that conflict? What do you think the best way is to resolve that? Or what if a couple, a couple buddies are, are having a fight, conflict? You know, we should play the song this way. Well, how, how, do, how do we work that out? What do we, what do, we do? I, I, don't think about it too hard. It's really simple. Talk it out. There's a little, little trick for you married couples and for anybody who has contentious relationships, maybe. If you're both willing to talk it out, you can get there. You can get to something good, right? And I'm not saying that there's, there's, it's always easy, but that's how you do it. And you know what we're engaging in when we talk to each other and we allow each other to talk freely? We're engaging in this very logos that we, we're talking about here. The word of God is, is that which can be expressed through talking, through you know, reasoning with one another, attempting to show other people, Here, here's how I see it, how do you see it, right? And you do realize that if you do that enough, you can, we can solve all of life's problems. I'm not even kidding, I'm not kidding around. We can solve any problem. You know, who's right and wrong when it comes to war? Should Russia have invaded the Ukraine? Is is Ukraine right for asking for help? I don't know. What what are the answers to those questions? I don't know. Um, What do we do about uh, our family relationships? Is it it wrong when people um, live together without being married? I don't know. Is it wrong when people... um, What's another example we can think of? Anything in your life that you might consider and be like... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we partner with God using scripture to find the truth about those issues and about those questions. But not in a vacuum, not by ourselves. We do it with one another. You know, there's a reason why we say we should, you know, we have our discussion groups on Tuesday nights now on Zoom. And we, and we say, hey, this is a good thing. We can get together. We can talk stuff through. And here's, the, here's the, the awesome part. Nobody gets upset. Nobody shames another person. Nobody puts down another person. If you say something you think is, is dumb, we don't laugh at you unless you're laughing, right? This is the key to being a, a group of people who are pursuing the truth, pursuing the logos of God, which is in the Bible. So why do we read the Bible? Because it contains and has in it the logos of God, this very essence and expression of God that we want to know so that we can have guidance in our life. We can have, you know, a knowledge about what it is that we should be doing. So Paul told Timothy that while he was away, he said, don't forget, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. This is why reading the Bible, teaching the Bible and talking about it is so important to us because it is the very very location, the very source of where we can get God with us and God communicating to us.